Uh, this is going to be a little bit fragmented because it was put together in three pieces. Uh, the first piece is sort of about horseshoe crabs globally. The next piece is sort of what they do, how they mate, stuff like that. And then the third piece will be interesting because it's about what we learned in Taunton Bay and what we're still learning about horseshoe crabs in Taunton Bay. This is not Taunton Bay. <laughs> this, is, this is Delaware, and the horseshoe crabs mate there about the same time as the ones uh, mate here. That's late May, early, early or later May and May, early June. And they provide an incredible resource for the red knots making their trip back. They stop in Delaware and they eat the horseshoe crab eggs and then they make it up the, the rest of the way to Canada for the, for the summer. So there is, they, horseshoe crabs provide some, some food source. Um, horseshoe crabs are not crabs. Um, they are much more related to spiders, ticks, and scorpions than they are, are to crabs. And I'll talk about one of the differences, big difference between crabs and horseshoe crabs as it relates to anatomy. I've mentioned these things. One of the interesting things is if you look at a, either a horseshoe crab shed or a, unfortunately a dead one, and I'll come to that in a minute, around their mouth, there's a bunch of little spikes. So when they're walking along, they chew their food as they go. So it's truly a movable feast. <laughs> and they're much older than dinosaurs. They are among the first species that emerged even before some of the plants. So they're really, really old. Uh, 450 million years and counting. And they're several flavors of horseshoe crabs. There are actually five kinds. The Atlantic horseshoe crab is what we have here. And there are four other kinds, which look pretty much the same. They're not, they're similarly shaped, but not identically shaped. They look a lot like early trilobites. If you've seen fossils of trilobites, they, they seem to come from that. I mentioned the migratory birds, particularly red knots depend on horseshoe crabs <coughs> for their nutrition. And birds are also one of their enemies. Um, the horseshoe crab, the reason it has a uh, particular value in medicine is because their blue blood contains a response to getting a peck in the hole in the, sh in the shell. The, uh, the blood responds with a clotting effect. So if a bird pecks a horseshoe crab, it immediately seals off that little spot. They still kill birds, still, they, birds still kill horseshoe crabs, and you'll find some on the beach, you'll typically see some holes in them. That's one of the things. We'll talk about whether it's a shed or dead in a minute. <laughs> so they're important to many other creatures. They are in the food chain. The little ones, the uh, up to probably about this size, get preyed on by green crabs, fish, and other things, because the shell isn't really that hard yet. In their earlier molts, they're softer shelled, and they can be eaten by lots of things. They also eat things. They, uh, as they march along, they look for worms, they look for small clams, and we'll see some of their digestive system in a, in a minute. And they have a very interesting nervous system. They have multiple eyes. There's a set of what people think is the big eye here, but these are the really interesting eyes. They're compound eyes and they transmit a lot of information, and horseshoe crabs can actually see rather well. In addition to that, they have good light sensors, not only here in this front end, frontal node, but also on the underside and the telson. So they can sense up and down because of where the light is. So it's one of their, one of their useful 
tools. And two researchers actually won a Nobel Prize by looking at the electrical impulses associated with the with horseshoe crab nervous system. But the most important human use is limulus lysate. Remember this, the crab is, is limulus polyhemus. Okay, so limulus lysate is extracted from the blood of horseshoe crabs. And we'll get to some nasty pictures in a minute. But the FDA actually requires testing medicines for purity before they can go on the market and testing medical devices before they can go on the market. And they have to be tested by limulus lysate. And it, what it does is sense the presence of certain family of bacteria known as gram-negative bacteria. And Graham was a bright guy, and he invented a dye that could tell the difference between a certain families of bacteria. So there's some very important gram-negative infections which you don't want to get. <laughs> and so that's the reason that mandated testing by the FDA is, is required. There are, because we're going to be drawing we don't pay attention to that. This is what happens with horseshoe crabs, particularly on Cape Cod. They get taken out of the ocean and they get drained for their blood. They have these amazing racks and they take about 40% of the blood and then it drifts into these little vials. The background color is supposed to be roughly luminous lysate blue, but anyway. <laughs> um, and there's some controversy about this, particularly because the blood drawers claim that there's about a 10 to 20% mortality from the drawing of the blood. But conservationists think, one, the mortality is higher, and they also know that reintroduced animals, after they've been bled, don't reproduce properly. They have fewer eggs, they don't have sperm, and they don't really do very well. So, it would be a wonderful thing if there were a substitute for limulus lysate. Well, there is one approved in Europe. There's an artificial one, but the FDA has not yet approved it. So I'm, I have hopes that we, it will get approved and we're still, the manufacturers are still waiting for FDA approval. <clears throat> so that's part one. That's the most important thing about horseshoe crab probably is the risk that they will be decimated by uh, the drawing of their, their special precious blood. The blood is blue because it's copper-based, not iron-based. And so that's, that's what we get, where we get the color. And there's an interesting question about why they haven't evolved much. Some of it has to do with the great design. This is just a fabulous design. The tail is useful for turning one back over if they get caught out of the water or caught in the sand or upside down. So the, this is a very mobile tail. There's a very powerful musculature in here. So that's, that's a good thing. That's a pretty good thing. The way they eat, they're, they're all sheltered when they're inside here eating. So they're going along the bottom Nothing's bothering them. Find a clam, find a worm, eat it. So, and then they have this wonderful uh, ability to stop gram-negative infections if they get a penetration in their shell. So there's a lot of reasons that they're very, very durable. And <clears throat> they haven't changed very much. They're almost essentially like the ones 450 million years ago. One of the reasons for that that some people speculate is there's a, the, there's a HOX, what is called a HOX gene, that is what determines where limbs go in, the, in, in an embryonic state. They apparently don't have a HOX gene. So it's possible, and these Delaware people speculate, that the reason they, don't, they can't change is they can't change. <laughs> 
they uh, don't have the right genetic material to change very much. But again, it's a great design. Why mess with it? Uh, in development, they're interesting too. Um, they, the horseshoe crabs come up in, as we saw in the first slide, on the beach, the females lay their eggs, and the males typically follow along. Sometimes they clasp onto them, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The, the males have a couple of special tools, and so they follow the females wherever they go. Females bury eggs, males come over them, and there's an advantage for the males to get into a chain, six or seven maybe, males tagging on to one female and a male and a male and a male, because whatever eggs are there, everybody gets a shot at putting sperm on it. So that's another part of their sort of durability that they get some locally generated variability and all the males get a shot at the eggs. When they first, when the eggs are first laid, they're smaller than a pea. They're a little tiny green, a little bit greenish, but not, not very, almost clear. And in the first stages of the, of the egg, of the embryo, it doesn't have a telson. You can imagine that having a tail inside an egg wouldn't be a really good idea. So the first hatching at about four to six weeks, <clears throat> they don't have a tail. In the next time they shed, they, they get a tail, the first tail appears. So again, it's a clever design. This stuff really, really works. And that leads me, to, and to get to maturity, I've seen, there's a lot of different numbers out there. Um, looks like males six to eight years and females eight to 10 years. But I think there's some variability in that. <clears throat> and some of it may depend on climate because the amount of food they get, how often they feed, like the ones in our bay, don't eat anything all winter. So they're not gonna grow much. The ones way south of here may eat for a much longer time period. So they might shed more often. So they probably reach maturity at an early, early age, or they may reach maturity, but we don't really know. And then shed or dead is really important because this crab it was a dead crab. And how do I know that? And this crab, which is not from here, was also dead. Because if they shed, they come out the front. Unlike lobsters and crabs, they, come, they emerge from the front of the shell. So if you find a shed, you will see a crease an opening all around that leading edge. Then the other thing about dead ones is they stink. My dogs love to roll on a dead horseshoe crab. They just, oh man, that's, that's better than being in a pigsty. I mean, it, it's just the best. So shed or dead is kind of important. Then as to mating, the males are specially adapted. And if I had to guess, I would say this is probably a female. This, this is probably a male. Notice the slightly higher arch in the front. That's so that the male can latch on over the telson of the female as it follows it up the beach. And they also have special boxing glove claws. Um, now let's go back. The front two claws on a male horseshoe crab have opposable thumbs versus a palm. And so they can latch onto a female and they latch on right about here and follow them on up the beach. And so everybody can tag along they report that males show up earlier than females. We haven't found that to be true in, in Taunton Bay, but apparently the males just can't wait. <laughs> and I noticed, <clears throat> I told you about the front end shape. 
I, this could be a male, but I'm not certain. It's, it's on, sort of on the margin. So, <clears throat> and the females are larger, um, maybe 20% larger than the males. Um, if you look at a distribution of prosomal widths, how wide it is from here to here, there's almost no overlap between females and males. There, there are a few males as large as the smallest males, smallest females, but very few females down into the male size. So you could actually look at horseshoe crabs and pretty much tell whether they're male or female without having to investigate whether or not they had the pinchers. So that's parts one and two. <coughs> Now, what do we know about studying horseshoe crabs in Taunton Bay? Everywhere else that we know about, for sure, they stay in the deep ocean and come ashore to mate. In Taunton Bay, they don't. I don't know about the bagadoos. I suspect it's a mixed bag in the bagadoos. Pardon the pun. Um, that, but the horseshoe crabs here, obviously don't want to go through the falls. That wouldn't be a good thing. Um, they probably wouldn't survive the tumbling. So what they do is they just go in the banks of the, of the uh, channels in deeper water, and they stay there from October to May, May April or May. And then they come out, and they mate at only a very few places. And the only time we see them are when they mate. In 21 years here, I have seen two horseshoe crabs other than in mating season. Each of them was in a shallow bay and just sort of scurrying along, probably looking for small clams or, or worms or something. So we only see them when they mate. What that means is we only can know about the male the mating population. We don't know anything about how the young horseshoes are doing. So until they reach mating size, we don't know. If you ask me the population of horseshoe crabs in Taunton Bay, I couldn't give you a clue. I know what happens when they're mating. That's all I know. Stay tuned. We put 26 little sonar devices glued right here. And we re released 13 of them in Egypt Bay, and we released 13 of them on Shipyard Point. And these are the subsequent sightings of those 26 horseshoes that we released. And you'll notice that there's no overlap at all. So that's how we know. And where they went in the winter was always in the channel. The sightings in the winter, the, the, where, we, where we located them in the winter, it was always in the edges of a channel. So we know for a fact that that's what they do. Good question, good answer. Yeah, Alice? Oh, you know, I don't know what the yellow things are. I should get this out of the way. No, no, it's probably something else. I'm not, I don't know what the yellow is. I'm sorry. That's from the Taunton Bay study and you can Find a copy of that on the online if you want to. Steve Perrin is the guy who did this work. He was out there in all kinds of weather, um, tracking them with a listening device and narrowing down where they were located. So every one of those observations is a Steve Perrin trip to the water. He's just an amazing guy. Pardon? It's, it, it's a transducer, and it beeps a particular signal at an interval, and each signal is slightly different, so he could identify which 
crab was which, which horseshoe was which. Yeah. And they lasted about three years. So this is actually three years of data for some of the horseshoes. Some, some didn't last that long. Some of them lost their transmitters, so they came unglued. But th that's a pretty clear picture that there's at least two populations in the bay. Yeah. They don't do well with green crabs. And my guess is, and one of my concerns is, and we'll get to that a little later, that we had the big green crab bloom in 2014, and they may have wiped out the whole new generation. They could have wiped out any, any horseshoe up to about that size, all up to two inches. But we won't know until we get six to eight to 10 years out from 2014, which we almost are. And I began to have some concerns, and you'll see some data later. I did tend to bore you, bore you with some data. Anyway, um, so let's see, I got interrupted, where are we? Here's an example of a train of horseshoe crabs. Oh, I, th wow. I think that's, and again, you can see the female is larger, the males are smaller and they latched on. And actually one of those males looks almost as big as the female, but there is some overlap in the sizes. And so everybody gets a shot at laying sperm on the eggs once, once the females get up, up on the beach. This is a nice picture from the this is from our shore owner's guide. Uh, and you can see the, the, the little claw that they use to attach. See the front foot is very boxing glove-ish. So then the, back to the, <coughs> the question of what may have happened. We noticed that horseshoe crabs were mating earlier and earlier and earlier. And that was part of what drove us to take a look at the whole bay monitoring project that we're going to do. So we're going to be looking at temperatures, pH, dissolved oxygen, and some other variables. And the, uh, the next slide is what tipped us off to the look just at the Jerry, I'm going to take this off. Okay. Because I want to move. Um, in 2019, they started to make on the 6th of June. In 2020, they started to make on the 23rd of May. They started to make on the 16th of June and the 13th of June in 21 and 22. So, May. May. Of, of May, I'm sorry. And the peak days also have gotten later. June was the 610th, 610 was the peak day in June in uh, 2019, May 29th, May 20th, and May 23rd later. So there's almost a two week shift, probably due to temperature but we're not actually certain. I looked at some data, I looked at the minimum and maximum temperatures. I don't see a lot of difference between those, so I can't really tell you. But we do know that they don't make until the temperature hits about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And sometimes they quit if it goes drops back below that. That's the surface temperature because the, the bay temperature doesn't change that radically. But when you get sun on the mud flats, you can get, what, 77 degrees, 75 degrees, in, even in, even in um, early spring. So I went back and looked at what had happened in the first four years of studying the horseshoe crabs, and I really don't see a lot of difference. I was happy. I didn't have totals for these because it was a different protocol. 
In that, in that study, Sue Schauer had a team of people, and they had three or four people doing every tide, and they actually took all the horseshoes out of the water, measured them, tagged them if they weren't already tagged, and then put them back in the water. So that was a much more intensive tour of the of the uh, of the shoreline of Shipyard Point. This is all done on Shipyard Point. Yeah. It seems like the uh, duration is almost double. The, for the earlier I example. think the duration also has to do with the intensity of monitoring, but oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of that. Not, yeah. I don't really know that. Can be a sampling. Uh, yeah. So I don't really know that. There are a lot of holes. If you if you look at the time series you may get one or two animals, then three or four days with no animals, and then a few more. So I, I think the peak, the peak days may be the best measure of, where, of the intensity. But the other thing that's pleasing is these numbers aren't radically different from 20 years ago. So I'm certainly fairly comfortable that we haven't yet seen a change in the mating population. That doesn't mean the green crabs didn't do their worst. Doesn't mean a thing. So, our horseshoe crabs are very special. As far as we know, except possibly for the Bagadoos and Merry Meeting Bay, our horseshoes do not go out in the ocean. They hang around in the winter, and they overwinter just probably dormant and not eating very much. As far as we know, this is the northern end of their range. We have not had any reports of horseshoes further up. Whether that happens with global warming or not, I don't know. But it's probable that they need an embayment like Taunton Bay, where they can hide out over the winter Rather even that rather than go out to sea, they've adapted. They've adapted by remaining above the falls, so they don't they don't have to weather that. <laughs> and they are slightly smaller than the more southern horseshoes. I mean, this is a huge. That's probably a Florida horseshoe. <laughs> uh, I never remember seeing. I grew up in Maryland. I never remember seeing any horseshoes that size even though I was that size. <laughs> this would be a, an immature crab. It's not old enough, whether it's male or female. And actually, the males don't develop the boxer club um, until later. It's, a, it's an adaptation that they get later. So those are things that we know. So, will they migrate further north if global warming continues? I have no idea. I don't know. Is there a declining trend in their numbers? I initially thought it was a little scarier than, I, than, the, than the data that I showed you was. So going back to four years, for four years, 20 years ago, reassured me a little bit. But again, it's only the mating horseshoes that we see. We don't see um, everybody else. Questions? Yes? How do you expect they got into Tottenham Bay in the first place? And when did That's a very good question. Um, when there was two miles of ice over here, they certainly weren't there. Right. <laughs> so, so I don't know. You know, um, it probably occurred when there was no falls when there was enough of a sea level that they could come in, and maybe they stayed in because they didn't want to go back through the falls when it, when it developed. But we don't really know. But that's a good question. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So is there any historical information on I mean, in the 18th century were people noticing them here or other places? Yes, and they were, they were using them for fertilizer. Oh. Yep. But in, in Frank and I don't, don't know that for a fact, but I know that they were used 
Yeah, they were. They were. Delaware. They were abundant enough right. that people were scooping them up and using them for fertilizer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce. I missed the very beginning of your talk. Have there ever been ocean clams up in the Canadian Atlantic coast? Not that I know of. No. No, and I, 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 I'm interested to see what happens. What will happen in the rivers further up, which have access to the water, to the, to the ocean water, and no barriers to passage like a, like a tidal falls, will they begin to show up in the rivers north of here? I don't know. I wish I knew. We're looking for them, but we can't, haven't, haven't seen them. Alan? So, uh, <coughs> With these being isolated populations over here, have there been any genetic studies yes. to these, compare them? Yes. These horseshoes are slightly different than the Cape Cod horseshoes. And I don't, don't know all the details of the genetics, but they're, oh, they're slightly okay. different. As far as I know, there's no difference between the Egypt Bay population and the <laughs> Shipyard Point population, but there may well be, because they're clearly isolated. Yeah. So the uh, green crabs eat the very young horseshoe crabs, but do the mature horseshoe crabs yes. eat green crabs? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. So, so there are friends in that department, but there are. But the green crabs are always our enemies. Yeah. Friend, how far would the other populations tend to migrate or move? I don't know how far offshore they go. I I don't know. Um, <coughs> they go to quote warm water. But, I mean, they may go as far out as lobsters go, or they may go just a little bit offshore. The, the common thread is that they like a sandy beach, and even here, they prefer loosely consolidated stuff that they can dig in, the females can dig in. So, uh, but, but how far offshore they go, I have no idea. Other questions? Yes. I understand that um, the, the uh, Bay of Fundy is warming up at, uh, faster than any place in the world, except for a similar bay in northern Japan. But I wondered, are there any horseshoe crabs in the Pacific? Yes. Well, uh, you missed the first part. Let's go back. There. Yeah, there are four other types of horseshoe crabs, and they're right around here. As far as we know, there are none in Africa, there are none in South America, but there are four Asian horseshoe crabs. And they're very similar in size, but slightly different in shape. Um, I think somewhere I read that there's going to be attempts to Farm yes. Scripts. Yeah. Um, two. There's two or three stories. Um, I'm going to sit down. Um, two years ago, we were approached by by Seacar, who had a, a British gentleman <coughs> who planned to raise horseshoe crabs in uh, aquaculture for the purpose of obtaining obtaining their blood. And he submitted a proposal. We collaborated on, a, collaborated on a proposal. We were concerned about giving him our horseshoes to play with. <laughs> um, so, but nothing came of it. Just this spring, we had interest by two groups of students, one from UMaine Machias and one from UMaine Orono. The one from UMaine Orono wanted to see what the effects of temperature change would be on horseshoe crab mating. So they wanted to collect some horseshoes from Taunton Bay and they wanted to get several, they wanted to go to Bagadoos and some other places. They came to my house, which is on Shipyard Point, and were unable to obtain any eggs. Another group from Yumi Machias came accompanied by their professor, Brian Beal, who is my hero, um, 
not only is the best teacher I ever had, he seems to know, know more about helping working watermen than anybody else in the world. He's just an amazing guy. Anyway, he came with a student who collected, <coughs> um, to, to, to collect horseshoe crab eggs. And this was very early in the mating season, so there were very few, very few uh, horseshoes at all. But he did find 11 already fertilized eggs in a female. So she was carrying them around on her gills. So apparently they don't just always lay them, they can hang on to them for a while. And he is now waiting for them to hatch out. He also took one of the biggest horseshoes I've ever seen, a big female. She's probably, she's not that whopper size, but she's probably this big um, and has her in a tank and wants to observe what's happening. So stay tuned for whether they hatch or not. Um, his intent was just to see, again, to see whether they could be raised in aquaculture. So that would be a partial answer to taking wild horseshoe crabs for their limitless life state. Yes? Well, it seems to me that the big problem with raising in captivity is they move and eat as they move. Yep. So you'd have to give them a lot of room. Yes. Which it would be really hard to do. She was in a really big tank. And I don't know what they were feeding her, but they have a lot of different kinds of food they could provide. So yeah, it was a big tank. Yeah, they'd have to have a lot of room. Yes. Hey, weren't they down in the Cape, down in Wuffley, trying to do similar kinds of studies where they have much larger population? I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I know. I know. I love well fleet oysters. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, except maybe for some of Taunton Bay oysters, they're they're really really good. But I know. I don't know about the about the cakes experience. Yes. Is there a specific number of times that they molt? It depends on diet in part, and diet in part depends on temperature. So they, they know about how many molts it takes to reach maturity, but they don't know how, when that's going to happen. So it's, it, it, it's like any, any of the crustaceans that if they get well fed, they will molt more often. If they don't get fed, they're not going to molt at all. Is there any attempt, attempts to um, synthesize the blood? Yes, there, there, there is an artificial, there, there is a, a, a <clears throat> European authorities have found a satisfactory replacement for limulus lysate. It has the same reaction to, to gram-negative bacteria and can be used as a sensitive test for testing medical devices and as I mentioned, particularly vaccines are all tested for gram-negative bacteria. Mm -hmm. So Europe has found, I used to work for a pharmaceutical company, and things in Europe are not as tight as things in the U.S. Mm -hmm. as far as uh, drug approvals, uh, medical device approvals, radiologic <coughs> device approvals, all those things. Um, and so, the U.S. has generally been slower to approve new techniques than, than Europeans. Yeah. Nick? Has anybody tried to uh, develop a trap to capture crabs, like a lobster trap? That has I'm unaware of anybody trapping them. I think, <clears throat> I wish. Dave Stevens were here. Does yeah. he get any of his traps? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I don't think they show up in traps. Um, and I don't know whether they trap them in Asia or not. That's a, that's a, I'll look into that. I don't, I just don't know. Alice? Do they catch them though to lead them? Somehow they gather them up. I don't know how they catch them to bleed. Yeah. My guess is they do it, they grab them during mating season. Easy when they just walk right up. Yeah. Yeah. and grab them. Mm -hmm. And they probably go for the biggest ones. Uh, it would be the, the most mature females would produce more eggs, and the most mature, ma the biggest males would produce the most sperm. So, 
<coughs> yeah, Bruce? You may have already uh, mentioned this, but the Chesapeake uh, is the area that the red knots are um, annually there during their migration north and feed uh, almost exclusively on limulus eggs. And so, and they have huge numbers of limulus there. Well, I started my first slide. Numbers. Uh, and so I would think that that would be the place that they would be doing research. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the Delaware Beach. Uh, but you're right, they're also in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, yeah. I grew up with seeing them. Yeah. Um, is there a like, map you can look up on the city of Delaware uh, where they would be heavy duty like that in the water? Um, yes, and some of those beaches are protected. There's some people who are very protective okay. of the horseshoe crabs and consequently the birds that feed on them. And so there are beaches where they, they don't allow anybody to go on the beach at all during the mating season. Now, how extensive that is, I don't know. Yes? When they are mating, do they come in on the tide and then go back out again? How long no. are they on the beach? Oh, that's interesting. Um, good question. <clears throat> and it's also part of a, of a clever defense system in a way. They show up just before a high tide, so and typically they show up on the highest of high tides. So a full moon or a, or a new moon high tide, they may begin to show up. And some people used to think that they only show up at full moon and, and new moon. But anyway, so they come in and they do whatever they're doing. It seems like there's a signal when the tide starts to go out and they all just split. <laughs> and we once tried to see where they went and we tied little streamers to the tags <laughs> on the horseshoe crabs and Shep Earhart was there and with some divers and when they started to leave they let these ones with the streamers go they were gone they just disappeared we don't know where they went we, we tied the tags on with little uh, De biodegradable string so they wouldn't get, get hung up. They can live outside the water as long as their gills are wet. It's not infrequent that I find stranded horseshoe crabs and they will survive over a tide. If you get them back in the water soon enough, they, they do just fine. They, uh, they have these book gills right here and as long as they're wet, they do a fine out in the air. So they don't have to, they don't have to be in the water all the time. So they can tolerate climbing up the beach, mating, and going back up. So what I think they do, if they think, is they avoid in-water predators by the egg-laying strategy. They come out of the water and lay their eggs at the highest high tide where the sun can warm them and hatch the eggs. And then at the next high tide, the little ones can get go back out, or not the next high tide, but at a later high tide, they can go back again. So it's another part of this incredible, durable animal that's been around for 450 million years. And does a female come up more than once? Yes. Lay yeah, they return. They they will lay two or three hundred eggs and do it several times. Yeah. Yeah. Could you explain again about the sensors and how they oh. know their depth? Or? I don't know what they do, what they know about depth. I didn't say anything about depth, okay. no. But it's light sensors. Right. They're very sensitive around this part of their shell to light. So they probably want to stay in the dark and they know if they're upside down and they're in trouble. Ah. Okay. So. So they know they know up from down, but right. they maybe don't know how deep. So it's like the vestibular nerve. I mean, where it it's, was originally to figure out which way was up and which way was yeah. down. I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, there, there's other stuff too. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, we live on Shipyard Point, right, right here. This funny 
claw shaped thing right here. And when we were buying our place, it was May 30th weekend, and we came to look at it, and I was taking pictures around the lot. We hadn't decided to buy it yet. We had to. We didn't know whether it would perk. We didn't know whether it'd get perk. You know, didn't know anything. <laughs> but my wife took a book and she's sitting on a rock, reading, and she heard this clacking, clack, clack, clack. What is going on here? Well, it was the horseshoe crabs, and they will try to mate with anything that looks like a horseshoe crab. So their vision is not that great. They, if, it, if there's a rock this size, the males will sort of poke at it and see if they can find a way to latch on. So she sit on this rock and it clack, clack, clack. So there were more that day than, than there usually are here. Yeah. Kevin? Oh, do they know the lifespan? Roughly. Um, we, we know that some of the um, breeding adults have lived 10 years beyond when they were first breeding. So that would put them at 20 years or thereabouts. Yeah. Well, that's all I got, folks. <laughs>